Good morning, I'm Jason Schaller, Curator of Entomology here at the Albuquerque Biopark. And I'm Maria Thomas, Curator of Plants here at the Albuquerque Biopark. And today we're going to take you on a tour through the Botanic Garden to show you some of our native pollinating insects and the plants that they help pollinate. Here in this patch of Shasta daisies, you'll notice a lot of pollinating insects flying around landing on the flowers. Um, the first one we'll look at here is a type of hoverfly. So uh, hoverflies are very important pollinators that mimic bees. There's many different species. Um, here we have a very common type of sweat bee around here. This is a ligated furrow bee. It is a ground nesting bee that is solitary. And you'll notice on the legs, there's lots of pollen being stored in special hairs. And she'll take that back to her underground nest and roll it off in a ball of your Larvae. This here is another type of hoverfly. There's quite a few species around here. Um, and then here we have another, which is probably another furrow bee. Um, there's a lot of them around the botanic gardens this time of year. We're here in front of the Bulgarium in one of our finest xeric gardens that we have at the Botanic Garden. What makes this great is it is a completely native landscape and it's extremely low water. All the plants in here, like this palmaris penstemon, like the pincushion cactus, the desert zinnia, all of these are wonderful xeric plant choices that support pollinator habitat. So this lovely lady is the Palmer's Penstemon. It is extremely drought tolerant. It gives you some really beautiful height in the landscape and it's suitable for all kinds of pollinators from anything from bumblebees to hummingbirds. So this is one of our native grasses. It's a blue grama grass. And while grasses don't provide pollen or nectar for foraging pollinators, they do something almost as important. They provide shelter and a place of refuge for the pollinators to take cover in storms and during the winter months as well. So adding clump grasses and native grasses into your landscape will really help support pollinator habitat. Okay, so this little guy down close to the ground is a sand penstemon. This one is so important because it does well in almost every county in our state. This plant supports what we like to call habitat connectivity and creates a way for our native pollinators to migrate across the state. This plant does exceedingly well in sandy, dry climates and will naturalize anywhere in the landscape. It's attractive to everything from our native bees to uh, hummingbirds and butterflies as well. The other thing that's going on here that's really cool is right underneath the sand penstemon is all of this leaf litter. We leave it here for a purpose. Uh, we have a whole campaign known as Leave the Leaves because what the leaves do is they control moisture evaporation and they provide a place for pollinators to hide out in bad weather during the winter months and also to uh, leave their eggs so they can overwinter and hatch out in the spring. So when you can, it's really important to just leave the leaves. So this little guy down here is an Escavaria or a pincushion cactus. It's really important to consider including cactus and other small um, succulents into your landscape because they provide pollen and nectar for, for some of our smallest native bees. Here we have a cluster of one of our larger solitary bee species here in Albuquerque. This is actually another type of sweat bee. And this one's known as the parallel furrow bee or Helictus parallelis. Um, we have three females on this flower gathering pollen. They are a little cold since the sprinklers are running this morning, but um, believe it or not, these are very closely related to the smaller bee we saw previously. Um, there are many, many species of sweat bees out there. Um, they make up a large portion of the 500 plus species of solitary bee we have here. And um, they're actually quite friendly. You can pick them up. They are very unlikely to sting you. In fact, a lot of the solitary bees here don't even have stingers. Um, the sweat bees do, and some of the leaf cutter bees do, and the mason bees, but uh, stings from these are extremely rare. You're very unlikely to ever get stung by any solitary bee since they don't have large colonies to defend. Um, and if you were to get stung by mishandling, um, they're very mild. They're not nearly as painful or severe as a honeybee or bumblebee sting. Now here's another one of these parallel furrow bees, but next to it we see a very different bee species. At first glance it looks similar, but this here is a leafcutter bee. 
Now leaf cutter bees are in the same family as mason bees and resin bees. And a lot of people have heard of mason bees and leaf cutter bees because they are already becoming well-known pollinators to help in agriculture. Um, you may be familiar with the bee hotels that you've seen in garden shops or heard about online, uh, which are basically a series of little tubes or holes and pieces of wood. And um, the reason people use these to attract these bees is because in the wild they nest in the boreholes left over by wood-boring beetles. Um, like uh, the other bee we saw, they are very non-aggressive. Um, you know, getting stung on these is very rare, but they are very useful pollinators. Um, so these have one generation a year, and they get their name leaf cutter bee because the females will actually fly around and cut off little bits of leaf from various plants and use them to build insulated tunnels within these wooden tunnels they find. They section them off then, so there's uh, individual chambers. Each chamber gets its own pollen ball from the pollen she collects. It gets an egg laid on it, that egg hatches into a larva, eats that entire pollen ball, and then metamorphosizes into an adult right there in the chamber and these will emerge the following year. Oh, there she goes. What you're looking at now is the flower on the end of an agave. They call them century plants because the rumor is, is that it takes 100 years for them to bloom. It's probably closer to 10, but once they do bloom, the plant does die back. It's still important to include these plants because they provide important pollen and nectar for night pollinators such as sphinx moths and bats. So we are now in the pollinator pavilion at the Botanic Garden and what we're looking at here are some of the best plants that you can choose to attract both butterflies bee, and bees into your garden. We feature annual plants in our containers such as gumfrina, um, some verbenas, annual verbenas, lantanas, bidens, and then we also have a strong backbone of perennial plantings such as sneezeweed, salvias, um, ironweed. There's so many great things in here and we're going to look up close at a few of them. So in here we have a great combination of both perennial and annual color. The pineapple mint adds texture and fragrance, and the tiny little flowers are very attractive to our smallest native bees. The Cleome is great for both butterflies and bees. And then we have this simple flower of the calendula and the dahlia. Pollinators tend to prefer this simple composition of the flower shape because it provides more nectar and pollen. Uh, double flowers are really beautiful, but it's not really what our, our pollinators are looking for. Lantana is another one that is an annual here and it does really well in our hot environment and both bees and butterflies just love this. Hummingbirds love it too. And then you can't have pollinator plantings without a Bidens. Again, if you look at this nice, simple composite flower, it creates a great landing pad for some of our pollinators so they can kind of take a little break while they're connect collecting their nectar and pollen. So this is a wonderful combination. It'll provide interest all summer long. And once the annuals die out, the perennials will come back and be one of the first things the pollinators will look for in the spring. So uh, this is a heliotrope this little purple guy here. It's an annual here, uh, as is this blue salvia, but annuals are a great way to get instant results when you're trying to provide uh, nectar and pollen for pollinators. They bloom really quick because their life cycle happens in the cycle of one season, so you get a lot of color really fast. Somebody's hiding out in this choya blossom here. Um, I don't know if you can see it from there, but uh, let's go inside and see who it is. Oh, well, it's a solitary bee and looks to me like, ooh, a type of digger bee. So digger bees are related to honeybees and bumblebees. They're in the genus Anthophora, and um, as their name implies, they are ground nesting solitary bees. You can tell it's an Anthophora bee by the long legs that they used to dig. And just like so many that we've seen before, they're very non-aggressive. As you can see, you can safely handle them. Um, many of these do have stingers, I believe. But, um, yeah, and basically the, paint, the picture I'm trying to paint here is, you know, solitary bees are nothing to fear.
This is a hybrid of our salvia gregii. Salvia gregii is actually a native salvia. This one's been hybridized with all these new great colors. So this one is called ultraviolet. Um, so they hybridize these salvias, these what we know as cherry sage, um, to be these wonderful colors of blues, pinks, uh, fuchsias, purples. Um, these are very hardy here. They'll come back year after year. And the hummingbirds and butterflies just adore them. What's really cool about this is the way that the flower is shaped. It's got that long tube that selects for hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, that's not to say a larger bee couldn't force its way in, but it's, th it's this way that the salvia is able to, um, whatever comes, has to force through that hood. And then while it's harvesting the nectar, it gets covered in pollen. So it's an incidental pollinator. It's actually going for the nectar, and at the same time, the salvia does its job and sends its pollen everywhere else. Yeah, so uh, hair streaks are uh, closely related to uh, the blues, which are uh, pretty small, inconspicuous butterflies. Many of them have bright blue colors on the top, and they're more uh, kind of a gray to brown on the bottom, on the underside of the wings. So hair streaks are named because of these tiny little uh, tails they have on the hind wings. And um, they actually serve uh, to mimic the head end. The two little tails look like antennae, so uh, predators will often not be able to tell which end is the head and which end is the back of the butterfly. So they'll go for the head and the butterfly will see them and be able to escape. Um, yeah, hair streaks, uh, they're all pretty tiny. Um, caterpillars uh, eat a variety of different host plants. A lot of them are very specific to a host plant. And the caterpillars are usually really small and oval and um, usually greenish. Um, some have different colored bumps and hairs, but most are pretty uh, naked and plain. So this guy right here attracts pollinators of a different sort. It's the voodoo lily, and it's related to carrion flowers. Um, you can see by the dark color on the flower that it will um, typically attract things that are more interested in rotting flesh, rotting meat, and similarly, if you get real close and smell it, it has a really obnoxious rotting meat kind of smell. Um, what this is great for is attracting things like flies, which are some of our kind of lesser loved, more unknown type of pollinators. But flies are a very important pollinator, and this plant does a great job attracting them to its flower. Uh, this is another wonderful example of right plant, right place. So these guys, they like it a little shady and they like it a little moist. Here at the Botanic Garden, we're able to create a little bit of a microclimate here in our arbor garden so that they get the right kind of treatment. If for some reason you decide that you would love to have a flower in your yard that smells like rotting flesh, uh, you would want to pick a nice microclimate like the downspout of a drain or the shady side of a house and then it'll be most happy. Um, right now, you can see the leaves are starting to cur curl because the sun is hitting them. Um, as the plant flowers, it'll then die back and it just lives underground during the hottest part of the months as a rhizome to come back the next spring. So this is a really great way that plants kind of conserve their energy for the right time of year. So here we are in our pollinator garden where we feature plants like monarda, milkweeds, fennel, we have eryngium, feverfew, chamomile, all the things that make pollinators happy. Uh, there's such a diversity of plantings in here that even when stuff like this monarda is not blooming, there's other things like the milkweeds that are and they can find forage. So right here on this bronze fennel, we have a hungry caterpillar chewing up all the leaves. So this is where I like to talk a little bit about integrated pest management. So some people may not know that this caterpillar that is chewing up this fennel is actually the caterpillar for the swallowtail butterfly. So uh, here at the garden, we try to use integrated pest management, which means we use the least toxic way of dealing with pests. We also have an acceptable level of pest damage that we're willing to be okay with so that things like the swallowtail caterpillar can just chew down the plant, pupate, fly off as a swallowtail, and then the plant will just regenerate its leaves later in the season. So this prickly plant 
is Eryngium or sea holly. It's a really great plant for the desert because it is extremely drought tolerant. The drier the better for this plant. And this crazy iridescent blue color you see is a good indicator that this is a bee magnet. And as you zoom in, you can see that there are so many different types of both honeybees, native bees, and you'll even see bumblebees on this quite a bit too. So not just with the eryngium, but anything like this Veronica, lavenders, catmints, it's that iridescent blue that they're really attracted to. All right, so this uh, little guy here is uh, not a bee. This is actually a bee mimicking fly. So uh, flies are actually very important pollinators as well. There's um, you know, several, several species of flies, various families. Um, one of the most uh, common pollinating families of flies you see is the hoverflies, known as uh, Surfidae. Um, a lot of hoverflies, uh, they're also called drone flies because they look a lot like uh, male bees. Um, and most are, I don't know about most, but a lot of your uh, hoverflies and drone flies mimic wasps and bees. They have uh, stripes, black and yellow patterns. But if you look closely, you'll see the typical uh, fly anatomy, the two wings instead of four, the very large eyes, the very small antennae, different mouth parts than a bee. Um, probably in this footage, most people would look at that and say, no, that's a little bee, but no, that is indeed a fly. Um, um, sir, can you point it a little bit? Oh yeah, so right here. Yeah. And then it'll take off very quickly if you, uh, you that thing. Actually, oh, look at that. Uh, it doesn't happen with surfids. So surfids are also beneficial because uh, their larvae are often predatory on aphids. Um, a lot of surfid flies have a caterpillar-like larva that's green and it basically uh, crawls around on plants and just eats aphids, white flies, other small insects. Oh, he's back on the flower. Um, a lot of surfids are also uh, decomposers. Their larvae live in uh, compost and um, basically help recycle nutrients. So great family of flies. They, they almost make up for the mosquitoes. So this orange beauty that's peeking out from all of this columbine is actually one of our um, native and at-risk medicinal plants. It's a Slepius tuberosa, or it's a butterfly milkweed. Uh, this one is also great because this is one of the top plants for monarchs and migratory monarchs. They, um, it's a host plant, so not only are they able to uh, harvest the nectar from the plant itself, but their caterpillars depend on the milkweeds um, to thrive. All right, so here's a very familiar large bee that everyone has seen around. These are valley carpenter bees. Um, they're one of our largest pollinators out there in terms of bees. Um, now, these are actually a solitary bee. They're closely related to bumblebees and honeybees. They're in that family, the aphid bees. But they are solitary bees, so um, these females, all these black ones you see are females. The males are actually uh, more of an ochre yellow color, they're smaller, and you rarely see them. The males are very short-lived, like in a lot of other solitary bees, well, and bees in general. But um, even though these uh, females look scary, they're very fast and loud, they often buzz around people's heads, they are very non-aggressive. Um, it's very, very rare to get stung by one of these. You'd have to really reach in and grab one for that to happen. Now these um, are one of the few bees that actually chew into wood to make their nests. So in the wild they'll find uh, either a dead or dying big tree, or uh, you know, in our cities they'll find wood in buildings, and the females will uh, just uh, slowly chew a tunnel system out with uh, several little chambers here and there, and then just like uh, the rest of uh, you know, bees, they uh, gather pollen, um, you know, usually on their legs, I believe, in the carpenter bees. Um, you know, they bring the pollen back to the nest and they you know, roll it into little balls, into the chambers, lay an egg on each ball, and it's the same life cycle you see in other bees. Now we're in our Cudendetta garden. It's our medicinal plant garden, and the reason we're here is because pollinators love herbs. Anything that you see in here is at any given time of day just covered in a diversity of pollinators. What we have over here is our angelica. And it is also related to the fennel that we were talking about with the swallowtails. So we'll see a lot of swallowtail caterpillars on this. This is another opportunity to talk about right plant, right place. While this is a beautiful addition to our Cudendetta garden, it's not necessarily the best choice for xeric landscapes. Where we've positioned it here, it gets all the runoff from the rock wall above it and from the hardscape below it. So all the water in this entire sunken courtyard drains into this one bed. 
So again, we've created a microclimate so that this plant can thrive. And this plant is related to carrots and fennel. Anything with this kind of umbrella type flower, butterflies are going to love. But you do have to kind of give a little because they're going to want to eat it as well. This tiny bee here is actually another species of sweat bee, and it's one of our smaller species you'll see around here. It's in the genus Lasioglossum, and most people will never even realize they're around because they're so small and fast, but they're there doing their part. So here we are on the back side of our Curandera garden, and we have two really important plants here for pollinators. First is this kind of tall, plant coming out of the green with the pink flowers, and that's another milkweed. And then down here by the path, we have our yerba mansa. So both of these are great plants and they're native plants for our pollinators, but again, we have to make the right pest management choices so that we're not eradicating these, these plants. The milkweeds, for example, um, Herbicides like Roundup are known to um, be especially detrimental to milkweed populations. And without the milkweeds, we don't have migration paths for our monarchs to migrate from our northern hemisphere down to Central America. So by the way that we impact this one plant, it can severely impact several other things in our ecosystem. Thanks for joining us on our plant and pollinator tour of the Botanic Garden here at the Albuquerque Biopark. And be sure to keep an eye out for pollinating insects around your own backyard or wherever you may be in the city. There's quite a few species out there if you look closely. And if you want more information, you're always welcome to call 311 or visit us down here at the Biopark. And don't forget to bring your mask. Okay, um, we'll just uh, get started with our live Q&A. If you have any questions, please fill out. Uh, you can use the chat box with YouTube or the comments. Hi, I don't know if you all can hear us, but uh, I'm Maria Thomas and this is Jason Schaller. Hi, how's it going? Um, I don't know if you guys can see me either or hear me. Um, I just assume you can. So, And uh, we've put together this little slideshow so that you can kind of learn a little more about the plants and the pollinators that you just saw on our tour. And we can hopefully answer some questions for you while you enjoy the slideshow. We have a question. Um, do bats ever visit the botanic garden? Absolutely all the time. In fact, when you come to our summer nights concerts, once they start resuming, um, you can see them all night long. Uh, we often find them in the day and lurking under bushes and uh, in kind of shadowy places as well. Yeah, I think we've uh, had one in the Bulgarian offices once we had to let go. It was pretty cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, also you um, can join night tours. Again, once we start resuming normal operations, we um, have several night tours a year that you can sign up online for, um, for the Botanic Garden, Tingley Beach. And um, you can see all those kinds of cool things then. I have another question here. How many times uh, have you guys been stung? I guess, <laughs> Jason or Maria? <laughs> Uh, you go first, Jason. You probably have way more interesting stories about this. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've been stung. Uh, I can't even remember how many times. So most of it is self-inflicted, just out of curiosity. 
Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Schmidt Pain Index uh, from Justin Schmidt, uh, entomologist from U of A, where I studied too. I knew him. Um, but I wanted to, you know, do a shower pain index for a little while as just kind of getting stung by whatever we could catch. Um, and most things are surprisingly mild. Um, one of the biggest surprises is cicada killer wasps. You know, they look like a big murder hornet, but um, and their sting is like, it's like a fire ant sting. Like, it's really, really mild. Um, so yeah, I've been stung by a couple of tarantula hawk species, but um, both of the, one was a hemipepsis, which is uh, the smaller ones. And that one was also very mild. Um, had a sting from a really large one, but I'd been holding it for a while, so it may have lost its venom. So. Um, worst stings have been paper wasps for me and um, uh, a type of assassin bug here called a wheel bug. Um, See, so yeah, I've been bitten by the giant water bugs, all different types. Um, yeah, they're about related to a honeybee sting. Yeah. Some bumblebees can be bad if they get a really good shot at you. Um, I've been stung through the shirt while we were, or through the bee suit while we were collecting a bumblebee hive once at the zoo, and that was kind of an unpleasant surprise. I still have a scar from that one, actually. I did quite a number. But um, yeah. It's been, a, it's been fun. <laughs> I think that the thing I've been stung most by at the biopark is the stinging nettle, actually. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's supposed to be therapeutic. So I'm, I'm probably doing okay with that. Otherwise, maybe just, you know, an occasional ant bite. But the bees have been fairly benign for, for me, at least at the biopark. <laughs> One other question came in. Are yucca plants good for pollinators? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the big flowers are actually very attractive to night pollinators. Um, so that's one that you would want to include if you want to attract uh, bats and sphinx moths, um, things like that to your yard. Um, and also they're great for any other pollinator as well. Could you go a little um, in depth with that information about the care life cycle um, difference between the annual perennials by biennials, if there is any? Uh, so the annuals, um, you know, they complete their life cycle in one year. Uh, biennials, usually the first year they form a rosette and then they will um, flower the second year. Um, a good example of a biennial is like a hollyhock. Uh, some primroses are biannual. Um, annuals are usually most of the bright color you see, uh, you know, the garden centers like marigolds, um, you know, things like th that. And then perennial, usually you have herbaceous perennials, which die back to the ground, but come up from their roots every year. And then you have woody perennials, which could be shrubs like rosemary and lavender. Uh, like you see Monarda right now on the screen. And then the salvia, those are both herbaceous perennials. Um, and so the care for all of them, it really depends on what you're um, taking care of. Uh, so it's fairly different. Uh, typically, but not always, annuals tend to have shallower root systems. So for the most part, annuals will require a little more water than some of your um, drought tolerant uh, perennial plants. Um, and then again, the with the perennials um depending on if it's herbaceous or woody or if it's you know kind of a, a native or xeric type perennial or if it's uh you know like the corpse flower that you saw on um, our garden tour the voodoo lily it really just kind of depends on what you're looking at but you know you can usually find some really good information online um if not at the garden centers where you buy the plants and then I think the most important thing is always just kind of taking that information and assessing your site and trying to find, like I said, the right plant um, in the right place. So if you have a really sunny kind of southwestern corner where it gets full sun all day, you want to find the right kinds of plants to plant there. Um, if you have a nice eastern exposure with some great morning light but afternoon shade, then you've really lucked out and you have um, a little bit more of a diverse palette that you can choose from. Thank you. And this one's for Jason. Jason, mm -hmm. are all four-winged bees actually flies? And what's the benefit of flies looking like bees? Um, 
Do you mean uh, two-winged bees? Because uh, bees all have four wings, um, and the uh, flies all have two wings. So flies are the only group of insect that uh, regularly has greatly reduced hind wings to little nubbins, um, and then they use their four wings for flight. But um, the reason they look like bees is mimicry. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, malarian mimicry amongst bees and wasps because uh, they all sting. So they've kind of evolved to mimic each other a lot to enforce that message of, you know, black and yellow striping means I can hurt you. And so flies, uh, you know, take advantage of that using Batesian mimicry. So they wear the same color pattern, but they, you know, don't sting or bite or anything. And it's uh, probably best to protect them against birds, I would imagine, and perhaps some other, uh, you know, day active small animals that might eat them on flowers. And they are great pollinators too. Not as good as bees, of course. Nothing is as good as bees in the big scheme of things. But um, they are very active and they go to all sorts of flowers just for the nectar. And Maria, with Leaf the Leaves, can I just put some leaves on the soil in my vegetable garden or should I get mulch? Uh, you can use leaves. Um, you know, the thing about leaves, if you're trying to mulch with them, uh, you will want to break them down a little bit. And I know that there's a, a, a big movement for no or low till, but it's nice to kind of uh, break that stuff down and it'll become more available. Um, and then the one thing is if you're trying to seed stuff, then you definitely want a finer material. Uh, so if you have a large layer of kind of more or less piles of whole leaves, you're going to have a problem with anything kind of seeding and naturalizing through that. But um, if you're just trying to leave it as a cover to overwinter, yeah, it's perfect just to leave it the way it is. And then that'll kind of help insulate the soil. It provides that protective barrier for overwintering um, insects and their larvae. And then also um, it reduces that moisture loss um, by kind of, again, insulating your soil. Uh, what I like to do is um, you can kind of work them into the soil in the spring, just very gently. And then that'll kind of help compost um, your layers, especially if you have like annual beds, like vegetables, things like that. Um, you know, and there's different philosophies because, you know, some people might say with some vegetable gardens, you really want to remove the debris. Um, rose gardens can be the same kind of thing because you're trying to remove some of the um, parasites or uh, like, you know, viral fungal infections that might be present on leaves. Um, so you're kind of trying to want to tidy up. So really, it just kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But I think with a lot of, uh, you know, native perennial plantings, um, it's entirely appropriate to just leave that mm. and try to incorporate it in your soil. Um, it also really helps with water retention once you do incorporate it because we tend to have really sandy soils. Again, if you're really lucky and you live in the valley and you have that nice kind of clay mix, um, you know, it's not necessarily as important, but for me, I live on the West uh, Mesa, and then for people that live up closer to the foothills have the same problem where any sort of organic material is a welcome addition. And are there any unusual pollinators at the Botanic Garden that we didn't see in the video or in the slideshow today? Oh, good question. Off the top of my head, um, I mean, there's a lot of different beetles and flies around. Um, one of my favorite ones is a, a type of checkered beetle uh, called Trichodes is the genus and they're really bright bright red and they have a kind of a dark blue uh, you know few blotches on them and um, they uh, well they're predatory and they also go for the nectar and they'll eat some pollen too but um, they have an interesting life cycle with a predatory larva uh, that's one of my favorite ones to find that you don't really think about as a pollinator. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'd have to think about that to get a better answer about unusual. Um, I like, I think two of my favorites are uh, the fig beetle, which Jason can probably help with the scientific name on that. Um, you really don't see them till later in the summer. And then they're just everywhere and they are huge. I mean, they can literally almost the size of a quarter. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, they'll, just buzz, 
they just like they buzz around like big battleships it's super cool and they're really brightly colored just a beautiful kind of emerald green uh and you know I, i've seen adults run screaming from trees when the fig beetles come kind of lumbering out um and they're really super harmless so it, it's amusing and then i also like the um sphinx moth or the um uh i i there's another oh the hawk hawk moth is that the other common name um, yeah, but, hawk and sphinx moths, yeah. It's a, hawk it's a moth, yeah. And I love those because um, the caterpillar is actually the tobacco or tomato hornworm. And so people, you know, will kind of eradicate those from their gardens, not knowing that it creates, you know, it pupates into a sphinx moth. Um, and so I really, that's another kind of IPM story that I like to tell is, you know, if you can just provide like an alternate source of food rather than your tomatoes and, you know, they really love Datura, Nicosianas of any kind, and then you can kind of just relocate them. And I mean, I've seen them chew down a Datura plant, uh, and then pupate. And then within a couple of weeks after, and, you know, this is kind of coincidentally, after the heat of summer is passed, the datura reliefs once we get our monsoons. And so it's almost a symbiotic relationship in that uh, it reduces the leaf mass that the datura has to conserve during the hottest part of the summer. And then it pupates and moves on. And then our uh, summer climate cools off. And then the datura has another growth cycle in the fall when there's more moisture. So, you know, I think it's good to kind of examine those relationships a little more closely than like, oh my God, it's eating all the leaves. We must get rid of it. So those are probably two of my favorites, I think. And, oh, yeah. oh, go ahead, Jason. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, I agree. They're cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is it true that it's dangerous for butterflies if they land on you? No. So, um, we tell that to guests in the butterfly pavilion because if everyone, all, you know, whatever thousand people a day, give a little touch to the butterfly, that's, that's a thousand touches that's going to wear on them. You know, they are delicate and stuff. Um, you can grab one, touch its wings, play with it a little bit, let it go, and it's going to be totally fine as long as you don't, you know, over, you know, put too much force on it. You know, they're pretty tough. Like, they get attacked by birds, get wing uh, chunks bitten out of their wings, and they continue on and live their lives out. But um, yeah, when you're at the bio park, especially in the butterfly pavilion, yeah, just um, because there's so many people going through, like, you know, please no touching. <laughs> if you let one crawl on your finger, that's a different story. That won't damage them at all. But um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yes. And then Maria, can you buy a Datura easily in Albuquerque at the nurseries? Yeah, um, Plants of the Southwest usually carries it. Uh, it also comes up pretty easily from seed. Um, it is um, toxic. So you really want to pay attention to where you're planting it. I mean, I've never met a dog or a cat that's going to go after it and eat it. But, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that uh, you're planting. Again, it's another right plant, right place. So, but I think Detour is another one that's, it's just a beautiful plant. It's so drought tolerant and it is ultra just um just magnificently attractive to night pollinators um so it's one i would certainly include in my garden and also it's a beautiful like if you're doing a moonlight garden with silvers and whites um you can combine datura with so many other plants like that to make a really beautiful um like kind of glowing night palette and if uh, anyone out there is interested in interdimensional travel, uh, the seeds are also an extremely powerful uh, hallucinogenic, but also toxic. So it's a very dangerous thing to try. I wouldn't recommend it, but interesting. Yeah, uh, people die every year trying it. So that's, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's mushrooms out there, a much better alternative. Not that I'm endorsing that either, but. Any recommendations um, from either Jason or Maria about how we can help out our native pollinators um, now during summer? Well, the best thing, and uh, Maria can elaborate here, is uh, planting all the right plants. 
Um, you know, the bee hotels are definitely helpful for select species like mason bees and leaf cutter bees. Most of our native bees are ground nesters. So um, there's really not much you can do for them in terms of, uh, you know, doing things to the ground. They're going to find their places around the right little soil microclimates they like. But um, just planting a lot of native plants, even non-native plants that are, have good pollen loads and nectar loads, um, just, you know, decorate your yard in them. The more, the merrier. Um, even just leaving some weeds, like I always leave some of the, I forget the common name, but it's a type of nightshade, Solanum eleagnifolium. It's a kind of prickly and has silvery fuzzy leaves with purple flowers and um, the bees love them. So I leave them all around the garden and it helps to attract a lot of stuff in. Yeah, I'll let Maria take it from here. Uh, I think it's important to choose a diversity of plants that give you um, the broadest range of bloom period. So pick your plants um, so that you have something in the spring something uh, that blooms through summer, and then something that'll bloom in the fall. And many perennials, actually, um, they'll do one bloom in early summer, and then you can kind of cut them back after the blooms are spent. And then uh, because we have such a nice, long, glorious fall, um, you get a second bloom cycle then. So, you know, just trying to provide as much of a... Um, palette, um, like an expansive palette as you can that covers all the seasons, that's really helpful. Um, and also when you're planting, try to plant in um, big groups of very similar things. So um, pollinators really like to have uh, like a migration path and they do that best with uh, like in this photo here, this is a perfect example of the Monarda and the lamb's ear and how there's just a giant swath of each that makes it easier for them to forage from plant to plant. Um, so I think that those are very important things. I also, you know, I always give a pitch about the dandelion because People think it's a weed, but it really isn't. It's a really wonderful pollinator plant. It's one of the very first things that bloom in spring. And so you can provide early forage for pollinators by uh, you know, determining what's a weed and what's truly not a weed in your garden. I think um, mono, mono plantings of lawns are just so boring and you can include things like uh, prunella, monarda, uh, plantain in your lawns, and then you have this wonderful diversity of plant species that provides pollinator support um, throughout the summer, even in a green lawn, for example. Thank you, uh, both of you guys. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions coming in yet. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to type them into the chat box and we'll be sure to get them answered. Thank you everybody for watching. Yeah, thank you for uh, having us. Yeah, and um, you know, please come down and visit us at the biopark. Uh, be sure to bring a mask because right now with COVID, we are asking everybody who visits to wear their mask. And also at the end of the slideshow, you can see um, both Jason and my email addresses. And we're always super happy to answer questions through email as well. So we really appreciate y'all paying attention and um, taking some time to learn about plants and pollinators with us. And yeah, happy gardening. <laughs>